Tell me, Jacqueline, where are you? I am right where I'm supposed to be on the Daily Huddle. Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday morning, the first mon Monday morning in August of 2021. Hey, 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 we say we're right here and that's the only place you can be. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And uh, Lee. Good morning, Lee. Where are you, my friend? Uh, I'm here. You're on mute. <laughs> now I'm here. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, and uh, you are here. And what time is it, Lee? Time is now. I'm ready to be to be awake for today. The only time there can be right now. And uh, Keith, how are you? And who are you going to hug today? Oh, today I'm going to hug one of my clients that I'm having lunch with today. And I am, uh, as I say, I am, and I'm wonderfully well. Then thank you. Thank you. And welcome everyone to the Daily Huddle. Today's, uh, today is Monday and it's dedicated to how money works. And uh, we have an expert in the mix with us. That is David Bradford. David, welcome and good morning. I good want morning. to take a moment to introduce you to the world. Uh, David was raised in South Carolina, played college football. Now, if you can take a look around his shoulder and his neck, and you'll see that that guy is just built like a brick house, right? Uh, played football at Woodford College and was a pastor for 10 years. A terrible divorce forced him to find a new career and wife in Atlanta. David sold cars, grew a startup company, and found his calling in financial strategies for entrepreneurs and real estate investors. Today, David's here to have a conversation with us inside of this question. How are you getting ready for the next market crash. David, it's great to have you on the Daily Huddle. Welcome. Good morning. Good to be here. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. So the next 12 to 15 minutes are yours to engage us in this question. How are you getting ready for the next market crash? Sure. And let, let me start by, <clears throat> and I've got some kind of thing in my throat, so you'll have to forgive me. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, how, you know, if if some of the things that you knew to be true about the stock market turned out to be not true, if some of the things that you knew to be true about the stock market turned out to be not true, how soon would you want to know? If some of the things that you knew to be true about debt, if some of the things that you knew to be true about saving money, if some of the things that you knew to be true about how to manage your money, turned out to be not true, how soon would you want to know? And the reason I'm asking these questions is a lot of times it's what hinders most people when I sit down with them and they become my clients and what I have to work through almost in a pastor-like manner. Um, I'm sure Keith can relate to that a little bit, the way he has to work with people. Um, is it's not, what hurts them financially is not what they know about money. And it's not what they don't know about money. There's a lot, we don't know everything, right? Um, but it's what they know to be true that turns out to be not true. And so those are the things that I battle with because the financial institutions, well, which ones are you talking about? I'm talking about the ones that own all the big skyscrapers in the cities. They're banks, right? Fidelity. And the regular banks that so you put your savings and checking, they own the market and they control the conversation. And because we don't get it in our schooling and education, they control the way we think about money. They control where we think is a legitimate place to put your money. They control what we are supposed to do with our money for retirement. They control where is a safe place to put your money for retirement. And so I ask this question because I don't see enough people asking it. The stock market has not crashed in 13 years. Typically, typically in the recent 40 years, you're going to see it, it, it correct. They call it a correction. By the way, 
Do you know what the difference between a correction and a crash is? If you're ready for it or not. Or unless you're a traditional financial advisor, they never call it a crash. They like to call it a correction. I'm like, dude, it's a crash. It just went down 50%. That's not a correction. It's a crisis. But when you look at when you look at the history of the stock market, typically you're going to expect it to crash in 10 years. And, and folks, it doesn't matter what causes it. Because I hear traditional financial advisors tell me all the time where everything's sound and the market's going great and the employment's great. Look, crashes happen because no one was ready. That's the whole point. OK, there was something that happened that people didn't factor in and it crashed. So I'm not a super student of the infinite parts of the market and all the balances. All I know is what what every financial advisor, what every financial person is taught in training, and that is trees do not grow to the sky. And what goes up will come down. And people aren't talking about this. And, and, and there's a reason why people aren't talking about this. The market hasn't crashed in 13 years. Do you know why people aren't talking about this? Because the conversation is controlled by the power brokers, by the big banks and Fidelity and the news and the news media. And so you're not going to find it in Money Magazine because all of their ads are paid for by guess who? The skyscraper folks, right? You're not going to hear about it on TV because if you want to destroy your ability to be a, 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 a good news channel, then say something and say, say the word crash and all of a sudden now you're a fear monger. Now, it's kind of ironic because what the news media loves to do is focus on the negative unless it's the Olympics, right? This is what's going on. This is who got shot. This is what's going, you know, the crime and COVID and, you know, the Delta variant, blah, blah, blah. But if someone starts talking about a crash, they get about a minute or two and that's it. So again, I'm not, a, I'm not fear mongering. I'm simply talking about the things that can destroy your money. And so most Americans have been trained that there are only three places to put your money. Now, just, just to be clear, Sorrell, he asked me, David, you're supposed to talk about the 13 year crash. You haven't really talked about it yet. I'm getting there, I promise. Um, but we're trained uh, by the financial institutions. We're trained by our parents who are trained by the financial institutions that there are three places to put your money that are safe. What is the number one place that most people put their money, period, that they put their money, not savings or retirement, where do you put your money? Bank. In the bank, right? So that's number one. A legitimate place to put your money? I would say that's a fairly safe place to put your money. Why do we put our money there? To grow? For liquidity. Exactly. So we put our money there for one purpose so that we can get to it and it's safe, right? We put it in a shoebox and the house burns down, we lose it, right? So we're going to put it there because it's safe and it's accessible. But who grows money in the bank? The bank, right? We, we know we can't put our money in the bank to grow it, okay? If, you know, unless you're talking about half a percent in a CD, which I don't call that real growth. The second legitimate place to put your money, anyone take a guess? what they call your biggest asset? Your house. Your house, exactly, your house. And so they say, hey, put your money in your house. It's a safe investment. It, it can be safe, but the market can change. And a lot of people learned that in 2008, they were upside down. I knew I know people who um, were living in Southbridge and you know they were upside down on their you know, $2 million houses for up until just recently. But even, even if you put your money in your house, you certainly can't access it, right? And there is no guaranteed growth there. And you're only going to get about 3 to 5% maybe a year appreciation over the long haul. Now, you can grow your money at 3 to 5%, but I wouldn't call that a place to really grow your money because it hardly even keeps up with, with inflation. And again, your money's locked away. You can't get to it. And so if you're sick or hurt or can't work, is the bank going to let you get to your equity? No, they are not. So that's number two. And the third place we all know, the only place that you can really put your money to grow, to compound for retirement is Wall Street, right? Stock and bond market, okay? And so of the three places that we have been trained are legitimate places to put our money, Wall Street is the only place that we have been told is the reliable place to put your money for retirement. 
invest for the long term. Don't worry about the ups and downs. And if you're if you're lucky and you get out at the right time, you may be able to retire where your money doesn't run out before your life runs out. And so that, that's why I'm speaking to the issue of a market crash. Now, when was the last time we had a market crash? Anyone? 2008. Uh, 2008 was, was a sustained market crash. That's correct. Free me. I got to put my glasses on. Lee, thank you, brother. I appreciate your interaction on this. Um, it's, it's actually more recent than that, isn't it, Lee? It was March of last year. The market crashed 30% in less than a month. And what kept it going back up? What made it go back up? Was it a strong market? No, because business was being shut down. People were being quarantined. Almost half the businesses in America were almost shut down or in kind of a holding pattern. How is it that the market came back after a crash that no one could have expected? The government pumped in almost $7 trillion, and that's called an artificial that's called an artificial foundation. It's been artificially propped up by government money. Guys, I want you to think about this. If you pump in $7 trillion, what does that do to the national deficit? We increased the national deficit by almost 25% in, in less than three months, guys. And so the market didn't come back, come roaring back because we had such a sound place. Everyone was in hysteria. Everyone was in a panic. What's this COVID thing? Do I have to double mask? You know, is this the end, you know, are, am I ever going to be able to go uh, vacation to the Bahamas? <laughs> you know, all these questions like that, right? And so we, ha we had a moment where we saw what could happen. And the solution was for the government to pump in $7 trillion. That has not changed. And so if most Americans have been trained and most Americans I sit down with, most of their money is either in their house or it's in the stock market, either 401k, an IRA, it can be an e-money account or something like that. And so the question you need to ask is, what is the time we are in? Now, Sarah, one of the things I appreciated about you this morning is you said, where are you now, right? So guys, look, I'm a pretty simple guy. I do financial strategies, I do it really well. I make my clients a lot of money and I do very well myself. But I like to keep things simple. I raised six kids. I learned how to communicate in a very simple way, okay? And so what I want to think about is this. Where are you now? So in the market, if your money's in the market, think about this. What is the number one rule for investing? This is basic stuff, guys. Buy low. Number one, huh? Buy low. Absolutely. Now, when I was growing up, that was a grocery store in my hometown, Lee. No, that's, that's a bad joke. That, that's almost as bad as the one we, we told about how to make seven even, right? But um, no, it's the most basic rule is buy low, sell high, right? Everyone gets that, right? So where are we at in the market now, historically? I don't mean since yesterday or the market's low today. I mean, historically. Super where are we at, guys? We're all, high. All time high. Right? We're, we're crazy high, all right? So if we are high, based on that simple basic law of investing, what should we be doing? Selling. Selling, okay, well, what does that mean, okay? First of all, if you're in Atlanta, your house or condo, or whatever, it's at the height of the market. Well, David, are you telling me to sell my house? No, I mean, you might want to, I, I don't know. Um, are you telling me to, to sell all of my stock in 401k and now have a 10% penalty? I'm not saying that. I'm saying, what does the principle say? You know what we're doing instead? Guys, you know what most Americans are doing who have regular career jobs? Every month, their, some of their income is drafted out without them seeing it, and that's their choice, and it goes into their 401k, which is invested in what, Lee? It's invested in the stock uh -huh. market, right? So what are they doing every month? Are they buying low or are they buying high? They're buying high. Guys, this is insanity. This is absolute insanity. Why are you buying in a high market? The most fundamental rule for sound investing is you buy low and sell high. So what, what does it mean? What would it mean to, to what I call pull over to the side of the road with your, with your investments? Pull over to the side of the road. Put it into a cash position. I'm not saying to cash it out. 
putting it into a cash position and hold on and wait to see what happens. Now, I'm letting you guys know, that's not what I tell my clients to do. That's how I set and frame the conversation. What if we removed ourselves from the inevitable market crash for a couple of years? You know, I had one client call me and, you know, the market was really volatile about two years ago. And I said, we need to get, they're older, they're almost in their 60s. And if you're in your 60s, I'm not saying that's as old as you can be. Okay, no, no, no offense here. Um, but they were, they were older. And I said, look, you can't take a 25% hit. So let's, let's, let's put this money into a cash position and let's wait until this volatility goes by. Well, I get a call a, a week, a month later. They say, David, I'm angry. I shouldn't have listened to you. I just lost $7,000. And I'm like, how in the world did I help them lose $7,000? So I got on the phone and I said, well, how did, I, how did you lose $7,000? Well, the market went up. And if my money was still in the market, I would have made $7,000. I'm like, wow, that's true. So how much money did you have when you, when you put, in your, put your money in the cash position? $55,000. Okay. How much do you have now? $55,000. Okay. How much did you lose? Right. You see the point. They didn't lose any money because the purpose was we didn't want to get into that volatility. So let me just back up for a minute. Back up for a minute. Big picture. What are the things that will destroy your wealth? Because my philosophy is, and this is really important, guys, that there is more opportunity in avoiding the losses than in picking the winners. Picking the winners means, how do you think Tesla's doing? Picking the winners is, hey, did you invest in Bitcoin? What's the new flashy cool thing to invest in? What's the big hot thing that can double my money in a month? That's the next big thing. But what is it that destroys our wealth? Guys, if we can, if we can build a, a, a wealth wall around our wealth, if we can build a wall like they used to do in the ancient times, they built walls around cities. If we can build a wall around our wealth that is bulletproof to the five wealth destroyers, then what is mine is mine to keep. Because most people agree, Lee, you've been interacting with me a lot, right? And I appreciate that. One of the other rules of investing in wealth building is it's not how much you make, it's what? Yeah. How, how much you, you keep. It's how much you keep, right? So you can say you made all this money in the stock market, but if it crashes 40 or 50%, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. So what are the five wealth destroyers that you want to protect yourself against? Today, we're talking about one in particular, and that's market volatility. The market will crash. It will do it. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to cause it. Could it be Biden's tax plan? It could be. Could it just be the regular course of time? Could it be some event that we didn't factor in? It could be. But we know that the market will crash. How are you bulletproof to market volatility? How are you bulletproof? What are you doing to make your wealth, whether it's in your house, whether it's in the stock market, whether it's in investment real estate, how are you bulletproof to market volatility? Number two, by the way, just, just to be clear, I am not selling annuities, okay? That's, that's not where I'm going, okay? And I'm not selling whole life insurance either, okay? Um, the second wealth destroyer I just mentioned a second ago is taxation. Now, Democrat or Republican, Biden and his, and his colleagues have some very aggressive tax legislation coming down that are gonna redefine how wealth is passed on to the next generation. You gotta be ready for that or, it's, or it's, it's gonna, you're gonna lose a lot of your money and the money you were gonna leave, that's your money that you were gonna leave to your kids is gonna be taken by the government. So you need to be ready and be bulletproof to taxation. I spend a lot of my time meeting with accountants and bringing them up to speed on strategies and tactics that they aren't familiar with. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? You're a business owner and your CPA, there are strategies that can, that can insulate you from taxes and eliminate taxes that you're not even aware of. The third wealth destroyer, so we got market fluctuation, taxation, and then there's inflation. It's crazy right now. Inflation's crazy right now. But typically inflation is about three and a half percent. That means the value of your money 20 years from now is cut in half. So that's something you need to factor in. The fourth is what I call devastation. And that can mean um, like, I think it's, sorry, Jacqueline, um, I think you run your own business. That's my guess. Um, if you can't work for six to eight months, um, how are you gonna pay your bills? A lot of people, they have to take the money that they've saved and use that money to get by, right? 
And so, uh, or if you have a family and, and all of a sudden, for, God forbid, you don't make it home because of a car accident or a stroke or COVID. And now how's your family going to get by? What they're going to do is take the wealth that you've accumulated and liquidate that wealth again. And so we want to be insulated from devastation. So you got market fluctuation, taxation, um, inflation, devastation. And the last one is litigation. Now, if you live in Atlanta, when was the last time you were driving in Atlanta and you happened to see a Mercedes or a BMW or a Bentley? Every time, right? And so if you were to get in a car accident or if you were to do something accidentally in your business that pissed someone off, there's a big thing called litigation, right? One call and that's all. And your, your wealth can be destroyed with one well-timed lawsuit. Guys, these are the five wealth destroyers that you need to be bulletproof against. And market fluctuation is the one we're talking about today. How are you getting ready? How are you getting ready for the market crash? So awesome, that's kind David. of my thoughts right there. David, you set it up beautifully for four more appearances <laughs> on oh, the Daily okay. Huddle. <laughs> yeah, so uh, market fluctuation. And uh, what I'm taking away from this is when, given that the number one rule is buy low, why would you ever buy now given how high the market is? And given how high the market is, if you want to protect your investment against what's sure to come, which is another crash, how do you protect yourself? Create, uh, liquidate your investment and put and it in a cash the, position. The way, the, way, the way most people protect themselves in their mind, yeah. I call it the gambler's instinct. Well, I'll wait. I'll hold on just a little bit longer. I'll hold on just a, bit, a little bit longer. That's why Vegas, that's why the house wins, right? Yeah. That's why the house, the house wins. always wins. You well, it's 25 after. We okay. want to create the opportunity for a couple of questions. Uh, Andrea, Lee, any questions? There, there are none on Facebook. I actually have a question related to how to put debt as your first uh, kind of um, focus. So yeah, you, uh, based on what I've learned, um, the first thing to do is get rid of debt because then that debt, you can use that money toward the investment or any other priorities. What are your thoughts about debt? Sure, great question, great question. And debt, debt is like a gun. And so if I'm in a part of town in a city I'm not familiar with and I get the creeps and it, it's getting kind of scary and I got my family with me, sometimes I wish I had a gun in case something happened, I could protect my family, right? But a gun can also be a, a weapon of disaster, right? It might even, it might even be turned on my, my, on my own family, right? You've heard about kids, they find a gun, blah, blah, blah. So debt this is really important because this is going to be a little bit different than maybe what most people talk about. Debt is a financial tool, period. Debt is a financial tool. The stock market is a financial tool. Life insurance is a financial tool. Real estate investing is a financial tool. N none of these are evil. It all depends on how you use them. Can I give you an example? Do I have your permission? Okay. So um, I get to, I'm going to be flying to Spain in about a month. Super excited about it. I'm flying for free. And you know where I'm going, right? I got these great credit card points. And so I use credit. We use all kinds of credit cards and we use a lot of different leverage with our points so that we get free stuff like free flights. That's kind of cool. But that can turn on you if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't have a plan, and if you don't have what? The number one thing with debt is what? Discipline. Discipline. Most Americans don't have discipline. And so if I was Dave Ramsey or Clark Howard, I would be hammering on people, get out of debt, get out of debt, get on a debt snowball. I get it. Because most Americans, they don't have the discipline to do that. So consumer debt can destroy you. It can destroy your credit. It can make you scared at night, all of those things, that's true. Consumer debt generally is a bad thing. And so 
And, you know, I think it's a good rule. And I don't know really who I'm talking to here. I don't know if, if most people I'm talking to are making less than 50 grand a year or, nor, or more. But typically, Dave Ramsey, Clark Howard, if you're making 50 grand or less, what they're saying, you need to do what they say. If I sit down with someone like that, I'm like, that's snowball. Let's get on it. Let's save up some cash reserves. Absolutely. But what I have done, if you're asking me what I have done, I have seen debt. Wealthy people use investment debt what we call good debt or a good use of debt to actually use other people's money to grow your own wealth. If you want to be on the slow track, let me give you two books, okay? And I can, I'll hang my hat on this one here, okay? Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. If you haven't read it, if you say, well, I did read it. If it's not like shaping your, the way you think about the world, then you haven't read it. Second book by Kiyosaki that I really love, it's called Retire Young, Retire Rich. And he talks about two tracks that Americans are on. There's a slow track, there's a fast track. The slow track is invest for the long haul. You know, aim for seven or 8% a year um, compounding. And maybe when you're old enough, you won't run out of money. That's the slow track. There's the fast track. Wealthy people use the fast track. They leverage other people's money. They use it with discipline and focus and they grow their money quickly. I'm not talking about get rich quick. I'm talking about acceleration, okay? And so for me, um, forgive me, Andrea, forgive me. Um, what, what I typically do is if I were sit down with you, typically I would expect to find money in the stock market somewhere and I would find money in your house. And I would say, look, if you've got a lot of consumer debt that's like destroying you or emotionally it's crippling you, even if it's not the best decision financially at the moment, I'd say, look, let's let's take, do a cash out refi, strip the money out of your house, which by the way, Sorrell is a great idea because if the market crashes, now you've stripped the money out before the market went down and your house value went down. Take your cash out refi, put it in the bank and, and pay down some of your debt. So um, debt, I, I, would just, I would just encourage everyone, debt is a tool and it takes discipline and discipline and a plan and focus to handle that. Awesome. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, right before we close, and uh, I'm asking for your permission to go one minute over, because that one's stuck in my mind, and I think it's probably stuck in the mind of everyone. You mentioned why are people investing in their 401ks now? They're buying high. How does that bode against what's called dollar cost averaging, where yeah. people are encouraged to well, buy now, buy now, buy now. You'll buy some high, you'll buy some low, and it will average out. Yeah, well, dollar cost averaging is, is what they tell you to do so that when the market goes down, you keep putting your money in the stock market. It's, it's what I call the butcher problem, okay? If you go to the butcher and ask what's for breakfast, they're going to say what? Meat. meat. If you go ask them what's for lunch, meat, dinner, meat, right? If you ask a financial advisor and, the, and all the people who you know, control the conversation, guess what the answer always is? The market's high. Let's get on a, that part of the high. The market's low. Hey, you're supposed to buy low and sell high. The market's even. Let's invest in the market. So we were there when it rises. It's always buying the market. It's yeah. another tool that people use. It's not a bad strategy. It's not a bad strategy. But it's also, again, why is it that you're putting your money into a strategy that is like this? Why are you putting your entire future into something that you can't control? And so what we, we create, we have investments that are contractual. We have an investment that pays nine, every 90 days, it pays 10%. Yes, contractually guaranteed. And it's all secured by real estate. I help my clients find short-term rentals where you can use other people's money and make your cash flow go crazy and retire early. But these are the alternatives that most people aren't familiar with. And those are the kind of things that I like to bring to people. Dollar, dollar cost averaging is not a bad idea. For most Americans who don't want to step outside the box, that's not a bad idea. Even Tony Robbins talks about it in his book that's this thick. But if you want to accelerate your wealth, if you want to step outside the box where the wealthy are, you've got to do what the wealthy do. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we'll stop here, David. I want to thank you for coming onto the Daily Huddle. You're certainly invited back and uh, you and I and Sharon will have a conversation. I want to take a moment to acknowledge Sharon Virgil, 
uh, the host for today's show, who invited David Bradford and made this contribution today. I also want to acknowledge Giovanni Gonzalez, my business partner, who will not be here this week, who is on vacation. Gio, have a great time. Don't call, don't do anything. Enjoy your vacation. All right, folks, we're going to sign off with uh, the following. Guess what? If you want to live a great life, be healthy, have great skin, be sexy for the rest of your life. Here are the seven things you need to do. You need to love, love always, love everyone. Laugh out loud, belly laughs until you fall off your chair. It will, it will help you stress less, which is the third. And eat sensibly, eat mostly plant-based. Give everything you've got, sleep, sleep, and then move like crazy. Uh, we're signing off right now and we'll see you tomorrow morning. Mr. Vince Roundtree will be here to take care of your health and well being. Until then. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, David. Wonderful. Absolutely. Enjoy being Thank here. You, Love David. to come back. Love to come Very back. Much appreciate it. Look forward to hearing.